a very important topic, obviously, in South Africa today, and uh, which we are engaged it from the perspective of, uh, of labor, representing the interest of workers, organized and unorganized, and hopefully representing the interest of a broader working class and society in, in general. I hope that I'm not going to speak for too long in the way somebody with that board. I always uh, do uh, uh, 20, minutes. 20 minutes now, okay. We can't have a discussion of this kind in our country without looking at where we are today, 25 years into our democracy, on a day so important in the life of uh, our democracy in the country when tomorrow will be once again exercising these very important responsibilities and rights we have to determine the destiny of our country. What is the context of the discussion on just transition? There's clearly uh, important strides that have been made and anybody who denies those strides have not been living in South Africa for far too long, or for too long. Electrification is important, water is important, increased access to health and education is important. Uh, collective bargaining rights are important. The democratic elections that we'll have tomorrow are important. And you can add your own, the list is endless. All of these things are absolutely important. The concern from our perspective is the last bullet there. The persistent economic challenges that threaten the gains of the present. And what are those? The unemployment, which is at appalling levels, 37% or around 10 million people. The fact that 52% of all of our, of our youth below the age of five are not at work, not at school, are not in any kind of training. They are roaming the streets. As a result of that, we're seeing an, epidemi an epidemic of, the, of, um, of drugs, Nyaope around Pretoria, and we're seeing the epidemic of gangs and gang wars and of violence, and we're in a country which is in the war that have not been declared, with 57 bodies picked up every day, and uh, with a chance that those who commit any kind of crime, 52% of them will never be identified. And of those that have been identified at 48%, only 15% of them will ever be convicted. We live in a country where 54% of the population live in poverty, according to Statistics South Africa. But according to the, some economists, they say you know, that figure is actually 10% underestimated, meaning that we're sitting with around 63% of the population living in poverty, and that uh, we have 14 million going to bed on empty stomachs or missing a meal a day. And uh, we're looking at uh, a stagnating uh, economic growth, which is not good news to all of the statistics above. The Reserve Bank say by in 2018 we will have a 0.7% growth in 2019, a 1.7% growth. By 2020, they say we'll have only 2% and 2.2% and, uh, and, uh, in 2022. The population is growing around 2% all the time, meaning that every time we grow below 2%, we're not solving the bigger problems, particularly the crisis of poverty and unemployment. And every time we grow just above that, we are not solving the problem either. So we are in a country that is facing extraordinary 
developmental challenges at this moment. And again, we cannot talk about uh, just transition without looking at, the, at this history. That South Africa is a country that is currently deindustrializing, and, uh, and with worsening wages and conditions of work. We see a decline in the manufacturing input from 23% around that figure in at the dawn of democracy, now estimated to be around 11 to 12%. We've seen the rise of precarious jobs and destruction of quality, not if, of quality jobs. We're seeing wages of workers that have been kept low and the median salary as way back as just about a few years ago at around 3,400. Now we have seen the introduction of the national minimum wage that says the wages should be at 3,500 as a minimum if you work eight hours and if you work uh, uh, every, uh, for at least five to six uh, days in a week. We have seen income inequalities breaking all the records of, of the world. And um, those inequalities have been a topic in the recent period because the people of Alexander have been on a rise and they were demanding that they be uh, looked after by the democratic state and they threatened to walk into something. Something that uh, some of us have warned long time ago. The persistence of these racial and gender inequalities are very painful. We, we're registering slow progress in reversing the inherited racial and gender inequalities. And more than 65% of all of the new promotions, according to the Employment Equity Commission, are still going to the white people, and that 75% of all senior management in the private sector in particular, remain white. This is, we believe, a country, a world on a knife edge. Millions of our people feel excluded, they are angry, they are frustrated in a society where only the rich get richer and the poor get more poor. And um, we're going to see that anger tomorrow. And it's normally expressed not by the people who go to participate in the polls, but it is expressed by the people who have long decided that democracy is not working for them. Right after the first five years of the democratic breakthrough under the Nelson Mandela government, the numbers of people resigning from political uh, or formal politics of elections started to grow. And by 2014, around 50% of the voting population didn't bother to go and vote. I hear that IEC is estimating that up to a third of the people who are registered may not go and vote tomorrow. And these people are not necessarily expressed by what you saw at Orlando Stadium. Uh, under the leadership of the Red Barates. They are not even there. They are sitting at home. They are teething with anger. And they represent what I've been calling a ticking bomb that uh, can explode any time. They are represented by the 34 service delivery protests a day. They are represented by what we call the ring of fire surrounding the cities where these major economic activities in the country. They're not voters. And uh, they think that voting is a waste of time. They don't support any political party, for they do not believe that any of the existing political parties represent their interest. They have a very, very negative regard of politics and politicians. So we're talking about a context where our state is in disarray, basically. 
Uh, we're going to talk, I'm sure, about ESCOM and the challenges that it is facing. But we can go across the board. The challenge is, uh, is immense. So what is then the just transition and why trade unions have two and have been concerned about the need for a just transition everywhere? Now that I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to, to try and, and take you through every bullet in those slides. Except to say, this is what we tell us uh, ourselves. I don't, Professor, I don't know what you say, but we, we, we normally, when we are we gathering together everywhere in the world, we say the concept of a just transition came from us, the trade union movement, in particular in the America, and uh, based on the, the concerns that were being uh, expressed about the CBA JG chemical facility, facility in New Jersey which was to be closed in the 1980s when the leader of the trade union movement there began to talk about the concept of a just transition. The just transition, again, is a, is, is a con contested uh, uh, terrain, including what it means. Some unions will interpret it very narrowly to mean that uh, you've got to take care of the interest of workers of the immediate. For example, what will happen to the coal miners in Bumalanga. Others uh, from the progressive side believe that just transition should refer to a broader and deeper socioeconomic transformation of, uh, or the societal shift to a sustainable low carbon economy or a zero carbon world over a period of time, not overnight, planned such that its impact, the impact of the shift, is not dramatic and can end up suddenly being the enemy to the workers and the society for which it is supposed to benefit in the long run. So transformation must reflect an appreciation that there will be that deep transformation of the current one because we have to agree that the current is not sustainable. That's the discussion in my view. In South Africa, I've not heard a single union that says, look, we don't care what will happen to our environment. Uh, I've not heard either NUMSA or NUM or any other union saying that, no, we don't care. All we care about is to protect the workers who are involved in the coal mines. No, everybody says a move away from the carbon-based economy is just inevitable. It has to happen unless we're going to have to see more of what we are seeing today in Durban, where 70 people died recently, and in Mozambique, where over 300 people died recently. So there's no discussion about uh, whether there should be a move away from carbon-based economy or not. The, the, the debate is going to be, what do we mean? What do we mean? So it is in that context that uh, we have to debate our fears, the fears of society of a unemployment that have reached unsustainable levels and the need to take us into a direction where we can say there's a deeper transformation of society towards a, a greener, more sustainable economy. There have to be a discussion, and in South Africa there is no discussion. Despite the existence of NEDLEC, and uh, we've been locked out of NEDLEC, and, and frankly I was just telling a friend outside that we don't feel that we're losing anything. I, think I was speaking to you. We don't feel that we're losing anything because there's no discussion of content there. Uh, Nedlec has become just a, 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 a space for nice pictures and uh, a parading a president, let's talk uh, uh, nice rhetoric, no content, no change of anything. We need a social dialogue, but we need social power, and I want to be frank with you. If the trade union movement will remain fragmented and weak, there's no way that it can influence a discussion that takes into consideration the issues that uh, we have raised. So we have to discuss this in the context, thank you very much, I think I'm wrapping up. We have to discuss that in the context 
of, uh, of the reality that energy still remains a source of emissions and that energy makes the largest contribution to global uh, GNG emissions through the burning of coal, of oil and gas. And uh, everybody knows that, I'm sure gathering here knows that. And that was a slide that I was going to take you through if there was time, just to look at uh, the, the, this energy and what is happening to each and every contribution of the aspects of all of the energies. And that one of decarbonization pathways is what we are also looking at in terms of what is the pathways and where we are going to and what we need to do to avoid that uh, two degrees global carbon budget of a decarbonization target. Again, the, I was going to take you through the emissions reduction requirements to remain within that uh, two degrees. But the economic impact is what I think we should open a discussion. And I'm not what, I don't want to claim that this is our work as the trade union. We're quoting the econometrics uh, economists who are making these, uh, w these claims. And frankly, these claims keep us awake at night. I know that some people will say, ah, this, this is exaggeration, this is not true. But if this was to go anywhere close to the truth, that this is going to what we're going to see going forward, then suddenly the concept of a, of a movement away from the carbon suddenly will become an enemy of workers in Bumalanga, of workers in the trade union movement, of all workers employed by ESCOM, and eventually of all the poor communities. And the conflicts that uh, the good professor was speaking about will become the major area, uh, era of discussion, area of discussion, instead of this uh, movement away from that. These issues, including who owns from where, who owns these IPPs, and uh, what is the role of, uh, of, 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 uh, of local communities? Are they being sidelined as they have been sidelined for over 300 years? Are they going to be just about statistics? Are big issues for the discussion that we should have going forward? If we don't have that discussion about all of those issues, then we're only building a conflict instead of a partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you.